So this video covers the microorganism Bacillus anthracis. Um, Bacillus anthracis is the causative agent of anthrax. Um, now, this organism isn't exactly a major pathogen. Um, and by that, I mean it's not a pathogen that we see very often. Um, between 1975 and 2000, there were probably only about three cases in the entire United States, um, but that all changed in 2001. In 2001, someone sent powdered envelopes of Bacillus anthracis spores around the United States because this is a bacillus organism and the bacillus organisms are spore forming organisms so what are spores spores are escape hatches um basically these are escape pods that bacteria use to kind of go into a uh, like a stasis when nutrients become limiting um so when the area they're growing in is high in nutrients, then they're just able to replicate as usual, right? But um, when the nutrient pool is not good, they need to slow down their growth in order to survive. So this is basically survival mode. So it creates this hardy spore that basically is just the um, genome of the bacteria, which remember for bacteria that's normally a singular chromosome and a basically hard shell. And these spores are incredibly resistant. Um, they're resistant to heat, they're resistant to drying, um, they're resistant to chemicals. Many of them are even resistant to autoclaving. So they're incredibly difficult to get rid of. So when we think about this, when somebody sent envelopes of these spores around, what they were doing was making it so that when patients inhaled the spores, now the organism is in a nutrient rich location. And once the organism goes into a nutrient rich location, it will begin germinating again. It will begin growing again. Um, so when this happened in 2001, um, many people died. Um, and it was an example of basically bioterror. Um, this isn't, like I said, an organism we see very often. We didn't actually teach it really before 2001, but um, now we talk about it. So what is it? It's a gram positive rod. Um, so you can see that here. Um, I always think they kind of look like little train cars um, back when my son was younger, he liked to play with Thomas the Tank Engine, and it always reminded me of his little train cars moving down his train sets. Um, it is a spore-forming aerobe, so it likes oxygen, and even though it produces spores, you're unlikely to see any spores in culture. Um, so you can see we're looking at, a, obviously, a, a patient sample here, but you're also not likely to see spores in a patient sample. Why? Nutrients are rich, so there's no need for the organism to produce spores. What you do see, though, are a ton of neutrophils. I mean, look at that. That's so many neutrophils in that area, especially for how many organisms are there. Um, this is a highly inflammatory organism, and that's actually part of how it mediates disease. It's just that it's so incredibly inflammatory. Um, the other way it does uh, mediate disease is through toxins. There are two toxins that B. anthracis produces. One is aptly named lethal toxin, and the other one is also aptly named edema toxin. It's non-hemolytic, so if you grow it on blood agar, you won't see um, a hemolytic pattern, so it's a gamma hemolytic, and it's not motile, but the toxins do plenty of damage, so it doesn't need to move anywhere. It does have a protein capsule um, that's considered a virulence factor. It's able to um, avoid phagocytosis, um, and it's got a worldwide distribution 
in virtually any mammal, although we typically associate it with herding animals. Um, so it's you're going to see it in things like uh, cows, pigs, bison, um, reindeer, anything that runs in herds. And it's been weaponized. Um, we know that based on the events of 2001, uh, when spores were inhaled after being sent around the country in the US. And we know that because um, in the Soviet Union, in Sverdlovsk, uh, the Sverdlovsk bioweapon factory exploded and um, 77 people were infected with inhaled Bacillus anthracis spores. So we are aware of its weapon potential. Okay, so first, it's an encapsulated organism. Um, it's a protein capsule, but it's not a polysaccharide capsule like almost every other encapsulated bacteria. Instead, it's this poly-D glutamate capsule. Um, D-glutamic acid is not found in humans, um, but this capsule is antiphagocytic, just like the other capsules that we have come to know and love. Um, and it's poorly immunogenic, so we're not really making responses to it. So that's kind of helpful for the organism. However, the real thing to know about this organism are the toxins. It makes these two toxins that I mentioned before. And basically, these are called AB toxins. They have a standard AB structure. So what do I mean by standard AB structure? Um, there are several organisms that make AB toxins. And what that means is that the toxin basically has two parts. You have an A part, which is your active part. This is the part that actually mediates uh, pathology, mediates disease. And then you have a B part. The B part is what binds to the cell and basically gets the toxin in. So if this is my cell and I've got my AB toxin, maybe I've got some sort of receptor or something here. Um, the B portion of the toxin is going to bind to the receptor and that basically allows delivery of the A active component to the cell. Without the B portion, the active component can't get into the cell. Without the B portion, the active component can't get in. Without the A portion, it doesn't matter if the B portion binds. The B portion can bind all at once. Just nothing's going to happen. It's just bound there. There's no effect on the cell as a result of that. So in B. anthracis, you basically have three proteins that make up two toxins because they share the B portion. So you've got lethal toxin. Uh, I don't know why I'm writing this out. It's right above. But basically, lethal toxin is the A component, which is lethal factor plus the B component, which is protective antigen. That's what it's called. Um, so that's LF plus PA. Then you've got edema toxin, and edema toxin still uses PA, protective antigen, but now we've got this edema factor, and that's what makes the full toxin. So why is this called protective antigen? Well, it's called protective antigen because it binds to receptors on cell surfaces of the brain, the heart, the lungs, um, all sorts of places around the body. Macrophages, that's a big um, place for it to bind, skeletal muscle, pancreas, things like that. And basically, that allows the endocytosis of the toxin through by creating this like transmembrane pore in the vesicle after endocytosis. Um, the reason we call it protective antigen is that it's immunogenic. We make antibodies to uh, PA. See, I kind of drew a little antibody to the protective antigens that are part of those toxins. Um, the antibodies will actually neutralize its attachment to the cells, so then it won't work. The problem is with something like anthrax, the organism is so inflammatory that just our antibodies to protective antigen alone will really help us 
most of the time. So then that means the actual enzymatic activity um, that we see in each of these, the lethal factor and the edema factor, have to have the activity that actually causes pathology. So what are those? Um, so for lethal factor, this is a zinc metalloproteinase. Um, so what does that actually do? Um, basically what it does is it binds to and cleaves MAPK. So it's cleaving MAPK and that's going to kill the cell. Um, this is also involved in secretion of cytokines you're going to get because you've got a lot of cell death you're going to get il1 beta tnf alpha macrophages recruited um, this is a highly inflammatory organism and that's part of its pathology um, so for edema factor it's actually a little bit simpler because we just really need to remember um, the adenylate cyclate pass cyclase pathway so basically when it's delivered you're going to get elevated intracellular cyclic AMP. Um, and cyclic AMP basically means that you're gonna lose um, fluid and electrolytes, and that's gonna lead to edema. So that's, I mean, that's kind of a standard pathway. So with lethal factor, you've got that zinc metalloproteinase that's cleaving MAPK leading to cell death. And with edema factor, you're just increasing cyclic AMP, which leads to fluid and electrolytes. Don't let this fool you, though. This edema factor is pretty serious because if you lose too much fluid in any given area, that can impede the function of the organ. Okay, so we see basically three clinical presentations of anthrax. Um, there's cutaneous anthrax, gastrointestinal anthrax, and inhalation or pulmonary anthrax. So how does this occur? Well, first off, it normally occurs because you've encountered spores. So normally the spores clump together and when they clump together, they fall to the ground because uh, they want to be near the soil. They want to be near vegetative areas. Um, when anthrax is weaponized, the spores are basically changed so that they repel each other. Um, so then they're not clumping together and they're small and they can become aerosolized. And when they're aerosolized, you can inhale them and that's how you wind up with um, basically intestine or uh, inhalation or pulmonary anthrax. The other way you could get it is through some sort of trauma um, for cutaneous anthrax, a nick in the skin with something that has the spores on it or um, gastrointestinal anthrax would be through basically fecal oral route, um, basically ingesting the spores. Okay, so you encountered the spores either through inhalation or trauma or ingestion. Now macrophages are going to pick up and engulf the spores and carry them towards some regional lymph node. Um, once there, the spores are actually going to germinate and become bacteria. They're going to become growing vegetative bacteria because now we're not... Um, in a nutrient limiting environment. So now you're going to have actual production of, you know, the B. anthracis organism. The vegetative bacteria actually escape from the macrophage. So they initially grow in the macrophage and then eventually they escape from the macrophage. And once they escape from the macrophage, um, they're going to proliferate into in the lymphatic system and they're eventually going to enter the bloodstream and that's a really bad news bears. Um, this is a highly inflammatory organism and it replicates very easily. Um, proliferation is massive and you wind up with basically mass septicemia. Um, it's not impossible or even uncommon that a patient with anthrax could wind up with, you know, 10 to the 7th to 10 to the 8th bacterium per milliliter of blood. Um, and if the strain contains basically your either lethal toxin or edema toxin, which are basically the two major um, virulence factors of this organism, then toxemia ensues and that basically leads to death. So that's 
pretty much how it works from a pathogenesis standpoint. So I mentioned um, gastrointestinal anthrax here. I'm not really going to talk about it very much. It's extremely rare in the United States, but it's also incredibly deadly, like 100% deadly. Um, it's got a mortality rate that's almost 100% or approaches it. Basically what happens is you get an ulcer that forms basically at the site of invasion. Um, and then that will uh, extend along the intestinal tract, kind of depending uh, where the invasion occurs. Um, you'll get nausea um, in the patient, um, vomiting, um, and then, you know, malaise, other symptoms. And then that basically rapidly progresses to systemic disease, toxemia, and eventually death. Um, so that's pretty much all we're going to say about the gastrointestinal anthrax. As I mentioned, it's thankfully very rare. Okay, so we're actually going to spend a little bit of time on cutaneous anthrax because of the naturally acquired anthrax, which again, this was very rare. Remember, there were only like three cases in 25 years. Um, but if you're talking about naturally acquired anthrax, 95% of them are going to be cutaneous. It's basically related to contact with contaminated animal products. So remember those herd animals, horses, cows, whatever, those tend to be uh, more likely to be contaminated because you're going to find the spores in the soil. Um, it begins with this primary painless lesion, a uh, uritic papule. So um, this is kind of an example of a later lesion, day six here. And what happens is you get this papule at the site of inoculation, and that's eventually going to form like an ulcer. And it's going to enlarge so you can see how it changed in shape on this patient from day six to day 10. And note that in the center here, there's this black necrotic tissue. This is the black eschar. Um, black eschar is associated with anthrax. In fact, um, anthrax itself is basically um, this black eschar here. Um, that's the necrosis that's caused by the lethal toxin. So that's almost entirely the work of lethal toxin there. Um, you'll also see some surrounding um, edema and lymphadenopathy. Um, that's from the edema toxin that we talked about earlier. Um, symptoms can become systemic if left untreated. In patients where it's left untreated, about 20% of those patients will go on to die. Um, but most of the time, if we treat patients, they can make a full recovery. So it is treatable, um, provided you actually identify it as, um, as anthrax early enough. Um, so remember that this vesicle forms and then it's surrounded by this gelatinous edema here. So this is the same patient that I was showing um, on the previous uh, set of slides on day six and day 10. But this is actually how it started. So you see kind of this gray material, maybe a little bit of bule here, um, and some edema around it there, um, basically the work of the edema toxin. And then it, um, you know, increases. So by day eight, you've got this dark, thick eschar here. This patient, it's actually somewhat interesting. So this patient um, is a male patient. He enjoyed shaving with a straight razor and he nicked himself and as it happens he likes to lather up his beard with a horse hairbrush remember horses are herd animals so there was some spores on that horse hair um, he nicked himself as people do and spores got in the brush here you have it so that's pretty much how this individual wound up with bacillus anthracis but thankfully some quick thinking doctors were able to recognize this as cutaneous anthrax treat him and he was just well. So with cutaneous anthrax, remember, you can occasionally have some systemic symptoms, um, low-grade fever, malaise, that regional lymphadenopathy that is, um, you know, associated with the edema factor. Really important with this one, whenever we're talking about cellulitis, so like when we talked about it with staphylococcus or streptococcus or even, you know, the C. perfringens group, we talked about um, debriding the tissue, cutting out the infected tissue, exposing it to oxygen, that that was a really important step. With cutaneous anthrax, never, ever, ever debride the tissue. No, 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 no. 
Because if you nick a blood vessel, if you introduce the anthracis into the bloodstream, it's game over. The, the patient's most of the time going to die from that. Because remember, it replicates so quickly once it's reached the lymph node. And you're going to wind up with mass septicemia. And once you have mass uh, bacteremia, even, then you're going to have mass toxemia, and it's the toxemia that's actually going to kill the patient. So it's really important not to, to breed cutaneous anthrax. It's really um, one of the few instances where I'm going to tell you with kind of a cellulitis-like infection not to do that. Um, the papule is usually painless. Um, the SCAR is painless. If you see pain, it's likely the patient also has a secondary infection that's causing the pain. And as I mentioned earlier, for the most part, if you treat it, patient's going to be five, only a five, uh, fine, only a 5% mortality associated with treated cutaneous anthrax. So now we're going to talk about inhalation anthrax. Um, this used to actually be referred to as an occupational hazard. It used to be known as wool sorters syndrome. So I guess, you know, they'd um, shear sheep, which are herd animals, and then, you know, take the wool into a poorly ventilated barn or something and shake it out. And then as they were shaking out the wool, they would basically inhale the spores, and that was a way that they would develop um, pulmonary anthrax. Um, what we know about it largely comes from the outbreak that occurred when the Sverdlovsk uh, bioweapons facility in the Soviet Union um, released accidentally a whole bunch of spores. Um, in that instance, 77 people were infected. And of those 77 people, even though they received maximal um, treatment, uh, 66 of them died. So obviously this has a pretty high mortality rate, um, upwards of 80%, um, even with treatment. So um, what we're talking about here is that you inhale the spores and then this onset from the time the patient has been exposed to the spores um, can take up to eight weeks, up to two months. And during that time, the patient is asymptomatic. Um, once the spores have been taken up by alveolar macrophages and um, other immune cells in the lungs, they then get transported to the mediastinal lymph nodes. And as you can see in this image here, then you wind up with this kind of widened mediastinum. So you can see here's kind of a normal chest x-ray. The mediastinum is, you know, appropriately narrow. You can see the shadow of the heart and the diaphragm down here. Here you've got the widened mediastinum that's actually occluding all of that. And that's kind of due to that mass um, edema and lymphadenopathy there. Um, so at first, patients are probably uh, are going to experience kind of a biophasic disease where they may even start to feel better for a little bit. So initially, they'll have these nonspecific symptoms, mild fever, malaise, myalgia, nonproductive cough, maybe a little bit of abdominal or chest pain. And the chest x-ray will show this widened mediastinum, and you'll be like, oh, well, there's your problem. Um, and then the patient starts to feel a little bit better, and then they'll quickly basically succumb to the edema, sepsis, and shock that is associated with the effects of the lymphotoxin and the, or sorry, the lethal toxin and the edema toxin. Um, about 50% of uh, cases will also show some incidence of meningeal symptoms, um, and about you know 90% of the patients will die um, two to three days in a fulminant course that basically leads to death. Um, and when meningitis occurs, there's a 90% chance that the patient will die. Um, there isn't person-to-person -person spread with anthrax. Uh, you're, you're not going to cough out the spores. Um, it's just that if you initially inhale them, then it becomes a problem. So diagnosis of this organism is actually pretty easy. Um, the organism replicates pretty quickly. So you're going to see an overwhelming number of organisms wherever you look. So it could be in the wound, like our cutaneous anthrax patient. 
Um, if you already know the patient is bacteremic or is showing um, lymphadenop lymphadenopathy, you might be able to see it in the lymph nodes. You can certainly, if the patient is already bacteremic, see it in the peripheral blood. PCR is an option. You're almost never going to see the spores because the nutrients are rich in the patient, so the organism um, is not undergoing sporulation at that time. So what can we do about it? Because it's got some deadly circumstances. Um, people have looked at vaccinating animals, um, herd animals, to reduce it. And, you know, we could do that. And we could also, um, in endemic areas, which is a lot of places, we could also burn or bury animals that die of anthrax. But complete eradication of anthrax is highly, highly unlikely. And let me tell you a little story as to why that's highly unlikely. About 20 years ago, some scientists were researching basically global warming on a glacier in uh, the northern hemisphere before it all melts, okay? And a reindeer herder came up and was like, I know I'm drawing the reindeer instead of the uh, herder, but you know, I'm better at reindeer, which is kind of sad because I don't think this is a very good reindeer. It looks more like a moose. But anyway, the reindeer herder came over to the scientists and said, I've got something to show you. It's amazing. You need to come see it. It's over here at the base of this other glacier. So they go over to the base of the other glacier and what do they find? But they find a perfect, absolutely perfect woolly mammoth. So this is my attempt at a woolly mammoth. Here's his tusks and his feet. And he's in perfect condition. One problem. He's dead. But the scientist is like, oh, wow, this thing is amazing. I'm going to take some scrapings from these from these tusks and hooves and see what I can find. So he took some scrapings and he sent them uh, off for growth. And what did they find out? They found out that there were spores on the tusk of this perfect woolly mammoth that were growing out the anthracis. Now, you and I have never seen a live woolly mammoth. And this woolly mammoth over here was 40,000 years old. So these spores had been frozen under the ice on this glacier that has now been exposed due to global warming for 40,000 years through freeze thaws, all sorts of horrible conditions, the spores survived and were able to grow out vegetative bee anthracis. So the fact that these spores can survive for thousands and thousands of years basically tells us that eradication is unlikely. Um, you can see this baby woolly mammoth. It goes to museums regularly and it goes by the name Lubia. The scientists gave the reindeer herder the right to name the baby woolly mammoth, and the baby woolly mammoth is named after the reindeer herder's wife, which if you like being named after a dead baby woolly mammoth that has a horrible deadly illness growing on its tusks, seems like a really nice idea. Um, so should you encounter spores from the anthracis, what should you do about it? Um, well, you can treat it. Um, ciprofloxacin and doxycycline are kind of the recommended treatment options for the anthracis. And that is all I have on the anthracis.